so for the benefit of our listeners uh, who can't see uh, the feed, Jeff, behind you is a whiteboard. And if I'm reading it correctly, it has Third Amendment, ECPA, 12333, FISA, and 230 written on it, which is just a potpourri of terrifying legal thickets. What are you doing to your poor students in Annapolis? Well, it could be my book topics for the next few books. <laughs> not, but, uh, not Third Amendment. You promised. You promised. Because the moment you write a book on the Third Amendment, it's going to become a thing and it's going to ruin our, all of our lives based on your track record. So it's impossible to teach law without teaching all of these subjects. So, I mean, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I want to know what your student was planning that the Third Amendment, because when a Naval Academy student has to be told about the Third <laughs> Amendment, that makes everybody nervous. Well, so so I will say there is an academic argument that the Third Amendment prohibits NSA operations on private sectors, telecommunications lines. I do not buy into that argument, but there have been law review articles written about it. So that was the origin of the Third Amendment comment on the whiteboard. I mean, the two exclamation marks suggest otherwise, Jeff. I don't know about you. You're very <laughs> enthusiastic about that amendment. Of course I'm enthusiastic. Who's not enthusiastic about the Third Amendment? I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah, so I would I would point everyone to the amazing Twitter account at Jim Amendments, which uh, is run by an anonymous person who goes by the moniker of Jim Amendments, who just tweets memes about the Third Amendment. Um, so, for example, he recently tweeted, I'm looking at it, a picture of Jennifer Coolidge that says, these soldiers, they're trying to quarter in my house unconstitutionally. I have a t-shirt. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I, uh, for some reason, my, so my garage, uh, which I, I inherited from- It's full of soldiers. Owner. It's a problem. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is not. <laughs> they are has, running over the place. <laughs> it, it is not, but it has like, it's such a bizarre bump out in the back. Uh, which it took us a year to realize what it was, which is, I guess, the old owner had a boat. And when they built the garage, they built like a little bump out for the for the, the prow of the boat. So uh, when the Navy decides uh, it needs garages to, to hide its boats in in the upper Midwest, I guess I guess mine is available. I, I will waive my Third Amendment privilege. Well, I'll put you on the list. <laughs> I knew there was one. I knew there was a list. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rational Security. I am one of your regular co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson, and I am, as is usually the case, back here with my two regular co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And Alan Rosenstein. Hello, hello. And we are thrilled to be joined once again by returning guest, Naval Academy professor and cyber law expert, Jeff Kossif. Jeff, thank you so much for coming back on Rational Security with us. Thanks so much for having me. We have had a lot of activity happening in your space this past week. I feel like cyber security and cyber affairs are often a busy territory, and that this week is still exceptional in that regard. Lots of things happening at the federal level, at the state level. Um, how do you keep up with it all? I don't know, but I'm going on vacation next week, so I'm hoping that it stops for just a little bit, just like one week. Well, you just... <laughs> You, you know that you've just cursed yourself and the rest yes. of us, right? You've said yes. out loud, you have, you, why have you toyed with the vacation <laughs> gods, Jeff? Why would you, why would you do such a foolish thing? <laughs> it's all going to go down next week. Yes. <laughs> well, we are excited to have you here in what, for what we are calling in your honor, the giving two F's edition uh, <laughs> for our special guest, Jeff Kossif. <laughs> Because we want to dig into some of these topics with you, uh, as well as another topic not strictly cyber related, although certainly cyber plays a big stream in it. Topic one, docs populi. Florida state legislature is the latest of several to propose laws requiring individuals involved in certain online activities to reveal their identities to the state. Are these requirements consistent with the First Amendment? What would they mean for civil society where they apply? Topic two, recommend forward. The Biden administration has rolled out what some had previewed as a historic new cybersecurity strategy, but it's left some experts cold, in part because it seems to hinge on future enactments by a cooperative Congress, something that may not be in the cards. How revolutionary is it really? And topic three, in honor of Oscars week, forget it, Jake. It's the Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> Hopefully people get that. It's a big. I, I did not. I did not get that. I feel like it's one of those one of those intros, Scott, where only you laugh at. Wait, are you what, kidding? What, I don't get it. No, it's Chinatown. Wait, what, what, it's Chinatown. 
I've never seen it. Oh, my my gosh. You have to see Chinatown. We're stopping the podcast right now so that Alan can go and watch Chinatown. (laughs) When we we start back up again, Alan will have watched it. And go. I mean, look, I, I hadn't seen The Godfather till last year, which is also horribly embarrassing. This is horrifying. Good movie, you need by to, the way. You need to just go watch Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, it's not about The Godfather. It's a great movie. Yeah. Okay, I'll go watch Chinatown. Okay, back to the podcast, everyone. Back to the podcast. Two breaks later. The House Select Committee on China had its first hearing last week to much fanfare. How much is it a partisan political exercise, and to what degree might it actually steer U.S. policy on China in a better or worse direction? For our first topic, Quinta, I'm going to hand it over to you to get us started. So as we said, Jeff has recently written about the right to anonymous speech under the First Amendment, which, of course, because of uh, what I think we should call the Kossef curse, means that it is under assault by a variety of state legislatures. The bill that has received the most attention uh, is a bill put forward in Florida that would require uh, bloggers who receive compensation to write about elected state officials to register with the state. Um, And this applies to bloggers who are not affiliated with a newspaper or other publication. Then there are also two other state bills put forward in Utah and Texas that would chip away at online anonymity by requiring some degree of identification to allow children to use particular corners of the web. So, Jeff, since you are the expert here, um, let me turn it over to you. Could you just give us a brief overview of why you find these laws so concerning and why you think that they violate the First Amendment? Yeah, so all of these bills in different ways require people to tell some sort of intermediary, either the government or a social media platform, who they are before they're able to communicate online, whether it be blogging about political officials or posting on social media. And the Supreme Court since the 1950s has repeatedly affirmed a very strong, not absolute, but very strong right to speak anonymously. So to separate your name from and other identifying information from the content of your communication. And the Supreme Court has found that this goes back to common sense and the Federalist Papers and so many other foundational documents that were not written under the author's real names. And the lower courts have repeatedly applied this right to the internet. And what we're seeing from these different legislatures are basically proposals that would entirely ignore these values and say, okay, you've got to provide someone with your identifying information. So there's never been a challenge specifically about these sorts of bills because they've never been attempted before. But I think given the level of scrutiny that the courts have applied, I think there's a very good chance that if they were to pass and be signed into law, that they would be struck down. Alan, I want to turn it to you next. I mean, this sort of broader area of internet regulation is something that you've been thinking a lot about, as well as the state of Florida's continuing assault on (laughs) the ability of people to speak freely. I should emphasize that uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor, has come out and said he did not support this legislation. So that's important to note. But I'm curious how you see this fitting into those two areas, the sort of general scope of tech regulation and sort of, I think it's fair to say, right-wing efforts in the Florida case to clamp down on political speech. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's very good of Ron to clarify that that there are that, that there's a point where even he won't go. I mean, J- Jeff is being very polite and professional because Jeff is both polite and a professional. But this law is batshit crazy. I mean, it it doesn't pass remotely any sort of either legal or frankly common sense test. The idea that uh, you would require people who are mean to the government to register is just sort of beyond grotesque. Um, and sadly, it's you know par for the course of what's going on in, in Florida, because although it is true that Ron DeSantis has come out against the bill, and that's good, right? It's part of a broader environment in which Florida is trying to weaken civil society, in particular, those parts of civil society that hold the government to account. So um, you know, Ron DeSantis might be against this bill, but he's certainly not against um, a bill that, uh, something I know Jeff has also talked about and, and cares a lot about, that would weaken the uh, standards for bringing a, a defamation 
uh, lawsuit uh, against individuals who criticize public figures, right? In in clear violation of the famous Supreme Court case, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan. And I think what just what this shows is that you know right now, especially on the right, um, though certainly not exclusively, there is a real moving away from what used to be pretty uncontroversial commitments to sort of basic free speech norms. Now, I do think it's important to distinguish between the bill in Florida and some of these other bills across the country, and especially those that in particular are directed at preventing minors from accessing certain parts of the internet. You know, I, I kind of want to make sure we get some time to talk about that because there I think it's actually a lot more complicated. Um, but I think the Florida bill is it's just it's just not controversial. And and again, it's great that DeSantis is pushing against it. But the reason, frankly, anybody ever introduced it to begin with is because of all the other things that Florida is pushing that DeSantis very much is supporting. So Alan, you actually previewed the exact issue. I want, I want to not push back, but maybe probe a little deeper about this. Because um, the Florida law, I agree, I think is like kind of the low-hanging fruit of unconstitutionality on this one. It seems clearly designed, among other things, to provide material to the state to intimidate people commenting on politics by revealing their levels of compensation and things like that. Clearly a problem on a lot of fronts beyond just the anonymity, right? It has all these financial disclosure requirements attached to it. But certainly the anonymity is also a big part of it. But the other laws in Texas and Utah that you mentioned in your article, Jeff, um, you know, they're child protection laws. They're both aimed at limiting the access of people under a certain age threshold. I know it's 18 in the case of the Texas law. I don't recall off the top of my head what the age was in Utah if they'd established it, to access social media and other sorts of resources. And in this case, both laws seem like they would impose some burden on people over 18 because they basically say, well, to determine whether somebody's under 18, everybody's got to provide proof of age, right? And presumably that's going to involve revealing your identity, at least to the service provider, maybe not to the broader public. A, I, I guess a question I would have is, is that necessarily unconstitutional, present the same constitutional barrier if it's not publicly disclosing the identification of a user? I'm trying to think of other industries where that come up. I imagine car purchases or firearm purchases, right? Which certainly firearms have a constitutional valence uh, that some people might uh, want to uh, pull in here. Works a little differently in the First Amendment, perhaps not as robust, but nonetheless, there's this idea about, okay, if we can cabin that and say you have to present age and we can burden it enough to put that barrier in, why is this fundamentally different? And then I wonder if it's really different if we're actually talking about kids. If you could find some way to you know get around this requirement so it didn't burden people, users over 18, the whole universe of users, do you think these same anonymity concerns would actually come into play with, with the actual target vulnerable audience they're trying to address, which is people under 18? Can we see speech get constrained in other environments, like in the schoolyard context, where, you know, First Amendment rights don't extend nearly as far as they would for adults in a comparable context. It strikes me that as there may be some more constitutional viability there, even if we might object to it. I'd be curious if you have policy objections or constitutional objections at that point. Yeah. So I think the, that the social media laws definitely would be analyzed differently than the Florida blogger law, but, or bill. But I think that there still are some pretty substantial First Amendment challenges. Now, all that we have to really go by are some very early cases in the late 1990s where there were attempts to require age verification and district courts struck that down on First Amendment grounds. Obviously, things have changed in a variety of contexts, so I don't know how much guidance those decisions will provide us. But I, I think that there still are some pretty substantial First Amendment concerns for a few reasons. The first being that it does apply to everyone. It's the, While the interest is in protecting children, if this Utah bill is signed into law, by Mar March of 2024, social media platforms will need to verify the age and identification of every Utah resident, uh, not, not just people who are under 18 or close to being under 18. So that, that really compromises everyone's anonymity. And you might say, well, the interests in protecting children might outweigh that. I, but I, I think that the courts will apply what they call exacting scrutiny to this type of restriction where there has to be a very, a very compelling government interest. And I, I'm not quite sure if you're going to get that here, because while, while there is definitely evidence of harm to children 
on the internet, I, I think that it's not as clear cut because first there are benefits to as well. I mean, yes, there, there are bad things that happen on the internet. There also are a lot of things that would not have been able to happen without having social media. Uh, and also, I, I mean, I would love to have been able to tell the Utah legislature that there have been cases in history where children under 18 have faked identifications, uh, <laughs> just sometimes in U.S. history. So uh, I, I might have heard of it. So one thing the courts will consider is how effective these are. And I, I think you're going to be compromising the anonymity of everyone in Utah for this benefit that we're not quite sure exactly how strong that is. So I, I think that would still have big concerns. I think the Texas law bill is actually even more concerning because that specifies not only do you have to provide your driver's license, but you have to provide, it's almost like a hostage photo of you holding up your driver's license to every social media platform. Uh, I, I should give the caveat, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Defense Department or the Naval Academy, but that's insane. Like that, you can't do that. That Nobody is going to use social media if they have to provide photos of themselves holding up their driver's license. But other than that, I think they're great. So first, I'm, I'm glad we got that. I'm glad we got that disclaimer in because because I, I feel like that's what you needed to say before you could start calling stuff insane, which is yeah. which is fabulous. So the, the second is, and so I, you know, I, this, you know, we're talking. We brought you on in part because you wrote this wonderful lawfare uh, post that just went up, uh, or you know, it'll went up on Wednesday for those who are listening to this on Thursday. And I had the pleasure of editing uh, you on that post and a pleasure because A, you are a fabulous writer and require very little editing, uh, but also because now I can sort of continue the kind of conversation we were having throughout that process, which again, I think is about this, you know, the issue that, that Scott is raising uh, about, you know, what does it mean when these laws are really aimed at helping minors? Um, and, and I guess my, my broader question or just kind of observation is, I, I think you're totally right that, you know, just because you say, well, this law is to protect minors. That, that's not a get out of jail free card. That's not some magic talisman that you can invoke and therefore avoid all the kind of First Amendment and other issues. But I do ne nevertheless wonder if, you know, those of us who came of age legally, right, in the sense of came, well, both came of age legally and came of age sort of within the legal profession and thinking about these issues in the last few decades have kind of taken for granted that, you know, we live in a world really defined, at least sort of theoretically, by cases like, you know, ACLU versus Reno, right, the famous case that struck down most of the original Communications Decency Act, right, and left us with its residual, what is now Section 230. And, and I think, you know, at the time, that was viewed as a sort of a great victory for everyone. And it was viewed as an example of, of the Supreme Court being able to sort of push against narrow minded prudery and moral panics. But I have to say, it does seem to me that data coming out over the last decade or so, and you know, just this recent report on the kind of horrible mental health um, issues among minors, especially girls, especially right, you know, L LGBT kids, um, which is I think relevant because those are precisely those groups that you would think are benefiting from the additional communication that the internet affords. I don't know. I, I do wonder if if maybe we've over rotated on on dismissing the um, harms that the internet can have for children, and therefore we have been overly cautious about the effects of laws trying to protect minors on broader speech because we've underestimated the benefits of those laws. I mean, I do think I don't know. This is all extremely complicated. I do think the empirical question of to what extent social media has good or bad effects on kids or anyone is a deeply, deeply complicated one. It does strike me that sort of think of the children serves now as it has always done as a kind of easy, well, not easy, but a, a way to kind of shoehorn in broader concerns about technology, if that makes sense. Like somehow if you say everybody needs to, you know, show their driver's license in order to use social media, that sounds wild. But if you say all the children need to show a driver's license or, you know, have have some kind of ID verification, that's fine somehow. And I mean, look, there are reasons why children aren't fully formed you know, adults, yet there are reasons why you would want more restrictions, but it does often feel to me like 
there is a way in which kids are kind of used as a stalking horse for broader changes that people want to make. You see that, for example, in discussions around, you know, the algorithm uh, related to the Francis Haugen leaks that a lot of the focus was about the bad effects on or potential bad effects of Instagram on the body image of teenage girls. Um, and so in that respect, these bills strike me as very consistent with that sort of policy approach to kind of shoehorning in broader changes by focusing on uh, the idea of protecting kids. Uh, Jeff, I'm curious if that seems right to you. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I, I think that a lot of policy, internet policy issues really are sort of introduced with understanding the impact on children, which I completely understand. Uh, I, I think that we have a lot of analogies between online uh, social media and other online harms for children and cigarettes and other dangerous products. And I, I mean, I, I think the big difference there, which is the same reason why there's a difference with comparing it to buying cars or banks anonymity intrusions is that this is a first amendment protected activity and uh, the equities are just very different. And I'm not saying that you can't restrict speech. We clearly do restrict speech in a wide variety of contexts, but the bar is much higher than it is for other areas that, that affect children. And I think that there does need to be a much better factual record to justify cutting off the ability to speak anonymously, not just for minors, but for so many adults. Um, one I, I debate anonymous speech a lot with, uh, with with a whole range of people, a lot of people who don't see it being very valuable. And I think that it's very valuable for people who don't have the luxury of speaking under their real name. So, I mean, I'm a professor who has tenure. I could speak under my real name. I could say much crazier stuff than I'm say saying here, but and I'd be fine. But there are a lot of people who really could face job consequences, people in unsafe home situations uh, who really need that. And so, so I think that that's just one example where, yeah, I mean, if there are such substantial harms that it could overcome this, uh, the benefits of anonymous speech, then it's possible. But I, I just think it's a very different balancing. I don't know. I just I just hear you and Quinta advocating for four year olds driving, drinking, and robbing up, robbing banks with guns <laughs> because because you can't have any child specific laws and posting on know. Facebook about it and yeah and the wor and the worst thing than posting on Facebook. live streaming <laughs> live streaming the whole experience. Well, from one set of online activities to another set of online activities, let us go to some discussions of the internet happening in Washington, D.C., because we saw the Biden administration finally, after a good deal of delay, roll out a long-discussed, long-anticipated national cybersecurity strategy, laying out its approach to the complicated question of how do we incentivize users and service providers and manufacturers collectively to take the steps necessary to improve our overall cybersecurity within the country, within critical infrastructure for consumers, for kind of the whole ecosystem of users and providers of cyber-related products and products on the internet. The strategy has kind of made waves, although in some ways I think has fallen short of what some people anticipated. There was a little bit of hype from people who saw advanced copies uh, and discussion of this being a kind of revolutionary new tack. And in some ways it is, but in some ways it isn't, or some people have criticized the idea that it is on the grounds that it really is actually kind of turning to Congress, identifying some in some broad contours, types of rebalancing that needs to happen in the allocation of liability between end users and manufacturers and service providers. And the fact that this is going to entail new regulation, but without really providing a roadmap towards doing so, and in particular, without acknowledging the fact that that's likely to be a very hard sell with a split control Congress currently with the House under Republican control and potentially with more Congresses to come down the road uh, because regulation is not that particularly popular. So I guess let me turn, Alan, to you first on this. Give us a sense of kind of your takeaways, like how revolutionary and important a document, a policy shift is this exactly? What do you make of the criticism that this doesn't really deal with the problem instead of kind of kicks it over to Congress? 
uh, among other criticism, because there's other things people criticized about it. What should we be making of it as a whole? Is this really going to be a pivotal shift in our discussion, or is it really more of a kicking the can down the road sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. It reminds me of those uh, kind of internet memes where it's like step one have an idea step two giant black box step three profit right you know they're 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 doing they're doing they're doing well on the step one you know we should fix cyber well that that's good and then the whole implementation question as you pointed out scott which is congress will have to do a bunch of stuff is the big black box so you know i on the one hand i do think that the administration should get credit for you know, thinking comprehensively about all the different elements of what increasing cybersecurity would mean, and of really recognizing and maybe to put it differently, you know, putting the final nail in the coffin of, you know, users just need to be better and have to have even longer and harder to memorize passwords and seven factor authentication and all that sort of stuff. And really make, you know, make it very clear that ultimately this problem will not be solved until the, until industry spends way, way more money than it does right now on improving the security of its products and that that will be unpopular because those products will be more expensive and they might not be quite as easy and fun to use for consumers. And so the market naturally will not, um, you know, in the fancy language of economics, it will not internalize those costs. And so you'll have a negative externality and the government will have to come in and and deal with that. You know, so I can imagine 10, 15, 20 years from now when Jeff is writing his 17th book and it's on how we finally fix cybersecurity in the 21st century, you know, he, he might look at this document and say, you know, this was an important document because this was part of the real paradigm shift in how we think about it. Um, the problem is that you know, this document isn't by itself going to do it for exactly the reasons you mentioned, Scott, which is that it really requires Congress to do all the heavy lifting. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, that makes sense. I think that it would have been disingenuous if the administration said, you know, we can do all this by ourselves. Um, so it's good that they're recognizing legal realities. But if you're going to say Congress is going to have to do this very complicated revamp of kind of basic incentives for the technology industry, you then have to have an implementation plan to be taken seriously. You have to have, you know, model legislation. You have to have identified the key players in Congress you're going to work with, not just the D Democrats, of course, but given GOP control of the House, the relevant Republicans. You're going to have to maybe have some model legislation, you know, sort of all sorts of stuff like that, you know, an outreach plan. And without that, it's sort of not clear what what's supposed to happen? Like what happens next with the cybersecurity plan? Um, and I think that's the the main criticism that's been levied. And I think it's a, frankly, a fair criticism. Yeah. So I, I think that it's a good step in the direction we've been going in in the past few years. So I, I think it really started uh, with the Cyber Solarium Commission a few years ago, having some really specific and narrow proposals about cybersecurity rather than just sort of these vague statements about we need to secure and deter by a cost imposition and uh, all of the buzzwords. Uh, I think the Cyber Solarium Commission really... Jeff, can you... Sorry, sorry Jeff, can you just remind us what the Cyber Solarium Commission, commission was? So, so the Cyber Solarium Commission was a commission that Congress chartered and uh, had both members of Congress who are fairly nonpartisan as well as experts. And they looked at the United States role in cyber and cyber power, and they had all sorts of working groups and hearings and events to gather information about specific ways to improve U.S. cybersecurity, uh, things like the creation of the Office of National Cyber Director and uh, formalizing a bureau in the State Department for cyber issues. And I, I think 25 of their recommendations uh, were signed into law in the NDAA a few years ago. And I think that really set the stage for some other really specific reforms in the past few years, like, I, I don't know how you even pronounce it, CERCIA, the, which is basically a law that requires critical infrastructure operators to report cyber incidents and ransomware payments to CISA, which is in DHS. And other things like that. So I, I think until that point, we didn't really have anything uh, of a, a, any really concrete nature that addressed cybersecurity. And I think this strategy is really 
setting a roadmap for the next few years. And I agree. I, d- I don't think there's very much that can be done without Congress and continuing to not be speaking for the Defense Department. I have my doubts about how much Congress will be able to accomplish meaningfully. I, I would say what stood out to me the most in the strategy was the uh, software imposing more liability on the software providers, which I think is spot on because we've had some really lousy software and the uh, manufacturers have very little liability for providing such insecure products. My concern, of course, is that it's no secret that software, the software industry has a lot of political clout. So I question how practical it's going to be to get that through into a statute. But I, I mean, I, I, I think that this strategy compared to previous strategies from the past few administrations is much more specific. And I I think that's a very good thing. So I will give a shout out to a piece or a couple of pieces in Lawfare, Um, one by um, Eugenia Lustre and Stephanie Powell, our our colleagues there who have provided a really nice just sort of rundown of what's in the strategy. And another by Herb Lynn about how the strategy differs from past practice. And we'll link those in the show notes. I will say one thing that I found really interesting and that um, kudos to Eugenia for pointing out to me, that unlike the uh, the 2018 Trump cyber strategy, not cybersecurity strategy, which is important for reasons I'm about to say, this document does not have anything about sort of questions about the health of the information environment. So misinformation and disinformation. That 2018 document had a meaty little paragraph in there saying that part of the U.S. cyber strategy was to address, you know, information operations. This document doesn't have any of that. And as Herb points out in his piece, that may in, in part be because this is fashioned as a cybersecurity strategy and the U.S. government generally uses a definition of cybersecurity that excludes uh, information or influence operations. So I thought that that was really interesting as a person who does study that kind of stuff. Um, and I wonder, I mean, I'm, I'm curious for all your thoughts, it, whether that... <laughs> suggest that we're sort of moving away from the place where, you know, issues about misinformation and disinformation have taken kind of a starring role in terms of how the government and the public thinks about security issues. I guess and so that's one way to phrase it. Another is, you know, is it right to cleave that off from this work? Well, so I mean, well, to try to answer both of your questions, I mean, I do think we're seeing that cleaved off. And I think that's probably, in the end, a, a good thing, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. First, and I want to be very clear, like disinformation, misinformation, these are real problems. At the same time, I do think that these problems can be a bit overstated. There really is a temptation to say that anything I don't agree with is mis- and disinformation, which again, doesn't mean that there isn't mis- and disinformation, but I do think that makes the problem a little less tractable. Um, and a little more open to sort of manipulation as a problem itself. Um, it's also much more um, politically inflammatory because, of course, the mis- and disinformation that people tend to care about is either straight up political disinformation or the stuff that's like political adjacent, um, you know, vaccine, COVID stuff. You know, you know, it, there, there's probably very little chance of of making a lot of legislative progress on cybersecurity issues if you have that disinformation, misinformation part of it included. And if you exclude it, maybe you'll get some spillover benefits where if you can sort of improve other parts of cybersecurity, that will also end up taking care of some of the mis- and disinformation part down the line without you ever having had to directly uh, deal with it. So it seems seems kind of clever as far as I can tell. You know, I, I think you actually hit the nail on the head there, Alan, with the political element of this. Because I actually think a lot of the strategy, the way it's framed and the timing to me actually makes some political sense in terms of how the Biden administration is posturing itself here, right? The point here, I think, is that a lot of people's criticism is that, well, look, you're coming out of a period we had democratic control of the House and the Senate, and you actually could enact legislation effectively. And now you're in an era where you have a split chambers and you can't do that. And so really, this is all a bit of a fantasy. And to some extent, there's that's kind of true. But I, I'm not sure in an environment and on an issue set like this, 
you really can go for the type of legislation that you could enact only with slim partisan majorities in both chambers. Um, when you're enacting a whole new legislative agenda, particularly in an environment where you have very influential stakeholders in the private sector, you kind of need broad political buy-in, I suspect, to keep it stable. And stability is really essential if what you're trying to do is a kind of system-wide security shift and expectations and norm shift, right? And to that extent, you actually need to cultivate bipartisan buy-in. And I kind of think the Biden administration putting this report out is a little bit kind of taking the ball and half handing it to the House Republicans and putting it in their court, saying, look, this is something we're going to have to work on and have conversations about. And we're not going to pretend like we are can make meaningful progress on this entirely without you. We actually need to engage on it. And in this particular moment, that's actually a lot cheaper for Democrats to do because they can't get their agenda through anywhere anyway because of House opposition. But this is an issue where hopefully, you know, the only way you move in this direction at all is building some sort of bipartisan consensus. So insofar as that takes substantial time, energy, and effort, this is when you want to do it, not when you have a Congress that you can be using to enact parts of your agenda that you're willing to move forward and make progress on in slim margins and where sustainability isn't such a big part of the picture. Cutting misinformation, disinformation out of it makes sense to me there. That's a place that's really a third rail increasingly, particularly for conservatives in the House caucus uh, and Republican caucus more generally, cutting that out makes this much more palatable in terms of uh, engaging. And now when you're talking about in this environment where you have China nexus coming, which we're going to talk about in our next topic, a lot of things where there's a lot of bipartisan buy-in around issues that are have close intersections and nexus with around kind of the cybersecurity production chain and things like that maybe they see something like an opening or at least the beginning of an opening. So I actually think this was not a mistake by the administration. I think this was part of the reason it's doing it this way at this moment, especially because it could have done this in the last two years and chose not to. And it makes actually a fair degree of sense to me as a medium to long-term strategy with the recognition that any sort of major regulatory shift like they're proposing is going to need to be sustainable and have that buy-in to be sustainable. Does that make sense to you all or am I being too generous? I mean, I, I think that if they included the word misinformation, then that just would have been the end of any <laughs> progress on on the strategy. I, I, and th this just comes from dealing with the subject every day. And, and I, th I think a lot of it does go, go back to what DHS did last year with this disinformation governance board, which I, I, I think that completely botched any possibility of addressing this in a bipartisan way. Let me take our focus to a different part of the controversy around this proposal, uh, or maybe less controversy, but maybe some more expert criticism we've seen, which is that one thing the report really leans heavily on is the idea that you need a proactive engagement, actively going out and disrupting major cyber threats. So they're talking about ransomware groups, hackers, things like that, seeing a concerted full government effort going after these actors, and in particularly talking about the Department of Defense going after them, right? which sounds like a little bit of a weird proposal that I think has some people at least reacting, saying, well, if we were to take this out of the cyber context, will we ever send the Defense Department out after you know criminal gangs um, because we didn't like what they were doing, even international criminal gangs, right? You know, Terrorism is kind of its own thing. We think of those as much more of a political threat. But the idea of we were to send you know, the military after groups operating uh, in, in different criminal ways overseas that affect U.S. citizens, that wouldn't be a pretty uh, high bar, potentially controversial bar to cross. Now, I think cyber activities are fundamentally different, A. I, but B, I think there's a line of criticism here that reflects a kind of weird idiosyncrasy slash built-in defect we have in how we think about cybersecurity in the United States, which is that we've concentrated so much of our capabilities in the Defense Department in that they seem like they're the best actor to be able to do some of these things uh, in terms of a capability standpoint. Yeah, they can do it because they don't just do things that blow things up. They're not just the military. They can be used for a variety of purposes. And we've concentrated all these capabilities there for political reasons, for you know budgetary reasons, for things like that, that make sense politically in the short term. But in the long term, it has created this awkward situation where a lot of things we would be doing to defending consumers, and that wouldn't probably raise nearly as many eyebrows if they were done by civilian agencies, or maybe even intelligence agencies, are raising much more eyebrows and particularly might be perceived as a much more hostile act by foreign governments because they're being done by our military. And I think there's some valid criticism of that from an optics perspective, at least, although I agree, it's a good strategy generally, and DOD is probably the best people to do it at this point. 
Am I overreading that? Am I exaggerating that concern? Or, or, or is there something to that line of criticism about how we structured our cyber capabilities? I mean, I think there's something to it. I just, I wonder if it's at a kind of higher level than the specific criticism, which is to say, I, I don't think that, you know, it should matter necessarily that much what uniform the person behind the keyboard is wearing. I mean, assuming that we are limiting this to specifically cyber methods, right? We're not pairing an aggressive uh, attempt to disable a criminal ransomware group, like with also a cruise missile at the same time, right? We're like, we're just talking about disrupting them using cyber means. I'm not sure why it's so much scarier or more provocative for the, quote unquote, you know, for the military to do this rather than the FBI. Uh, so in that sense, that, that, that fixation seems like a little misplaced. Now, I think there is a broader question which has actually very little to do with cyber in particular, and more to this decades long tendency that policymakers have had of just kind of making the military in charge of more and more things, right? I mean, the big example here is nation building and, and foreign aid and that sort of stuff, which is something that the military is probably not best suited at. And even if it can learn, which it, I'm sure it can, it's a very sophisticated organization. Um, it's just not that helpful. Um, for an organization to be doing so many different things. It's not good for its core mission to kind of be distracted by all this other stuff. So if the concern is, look, you know, we want to have a military that is going you know, to lean and specialized in war fighting. And so we're not going to distract it with fighting ransomware gangs in Albania or wherever. I'm just making this up, right? That seems like a perfectly good shout out to all my, um, all our Albanian fr- fans. You guys are the best uh, ransomware criminals are everywhere. To be clear, you're our favorite ransomware criminal listeners, <laughs> Albanians. You've got a special place in our heart. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're open to sponsorships. Um, no, no, we're not. Uh, you know, if, if that's the case, then I think I do understand that, that criticism, but I think it's a mistake to get too freaked out that, you know, oh my God, it's cyber command going after these ransomware folks rather than someone at DHS or someone at FBI. Like it's the same, you know, logic bomb as people used to say, that'll be used. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that's where our capabilities are. Um, my my two favorite legal principles are the First Amendment and putting the military in charge of more things. So that's my personal view. No, <laughs> um, so that's actually that's actually your official position on behalf of the, yeah, of that, the naval that, department. That's my personal view. Those don't um, often go together. So it's an but, interesting combo. It's actually the Third Amendment is actually where they where they actually yeah meet. exactly. <laughs> but but I I do think that that is where our capabilities are. I think we're pretty late to this, and I think when you look at what our adversaries have been doing for years. I, I wish we had a clearer statement of this earlier. Um, w- when you look at the evolution of the U.S. stance, you had active defense, which was really reserved. And then you had defend forward, which was sort of putting your toe in the water. And, and now the current policy is, I think, where we should be and where we should have been for a while now, because we're, we've really allowed our adversaries to get away with far too much when our capabilities, frankly, are at least partly with the military. From one cyber great power, the United States, to another cyber great power, and just great power generally, China. Let's talk about the China Committee. So uh, a new House committee, the formal title is the United United States House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. It's a mouthful. Um, held his first hearing last month. It's it's headed by Republican Mike Gallagher and Democrat uh, Raja Krishnamurthy. The the framing of the committee has been pretty intense. Um, in his opening remarks, Gallagher described the U.S. China relationship as quote an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century, and the most fundamental freedoms are at stake. So not a uh, not a trivial thing. Um, the committee scope is broad, ranging from trade to military competition to China's influence on social media through apps like TikTok and sort of anything and everything you can think of. And, you know, the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about the first uh, committee meeting that they had was that there was this kind of almost like made for TV moment when uh, two protesters from the left wing anti war organization Code Pink disrupted the meeting by standing up and holding signs saying China is not our enemy and stop Asian hate. So a, a pretty uh, a pretty exciting way to kick this uh, committee off. So 
uh, Scott, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, why does this committee exist? Is there any good reason for it? Or is it just Congress needs something to do with its time? So it's a good question. Uh, and I think it's one of those questions we have to see play out to some extent to have the full answer. The explanation of why we need it is that China is a big policy problem. I think there's broad agreement between both parties on that, uh, although different maybe concepts of, of the scope of that problem uh, and the administration is worth noting. And that that problem kind of has crosses lots of different policy areas. And that in the same way you have sometimes a particular czar, they're often called, or somebody else stationed in the White House to coordinate interagency policy coordination on a particularly high priority topic, sometimes you will see efforts in Congress to channel particular issue sets that are cross-cutting like that through a special body. And that's what the select committee does, right? That's the most optimistic take. The more skeptical, critical take, I think, is something along the lines of, well, you know, House Republicans wanted an issue that they can try and beat up the Biden administration over and that they can use to look stronger than the Biden administration on foreign policy and that this is the way to do that. And this is simply not much more than a political sideshow. But it is it is quite bipartisan if that's the if that's the goal, right? The, the committee is bipartisan. Yeah. I mean, it's majority, it's, it's got a two member majority edge, right? That's, which is pretty standard for these sorts of committees. Other committees have much more substantial partisan edges, um, standing committees, but, but it's got a slight, you know, edge towards the Republicans, the majority party, as we would expect, not unusual there. And its composition is really notable because it's actually a pretty serious group, actually, especially on the Democrat side, I would say. Not that the Republicans aren't. The Democrat side, they really stacked it with a lot of their kind of foreign policy leaders, right? You got people with really substantial experience in the executive branch. You have Andy Kim, um, who used to be on the National Security Council, Defense Department, State Department. Uh, you have Ro Khanna, who's kind of emerged as the kind of progressive foreign policy leader for the Democrats. You have Seth Moulton, who's a veteran, very outspoken on a variety of national security issues. Um, and then you have Rajna Krishnamurthy, who, uh, as you mentioned, introdu introduction, Alan, is a pretty senior kind of party guy, I think a little bit of an up and comer, somebody who has a lot of sway with party leadership, particularly this new generation of leadership that's kind of emerged. Um, and that's really just the beginning. It's a really, really young group on both sides, particularly on the Democrat side again. Um, but really, Republicans as well have a lot of kind of new up and comers here. And, it, and it's a really serious group. You don't see a lot of kind of Jim Jordan types that are expected to drill things up in a very partisan direction. Uh, Mike Gallagher, the chair of it, who was very young, established, I believe himself a veteran, certainly someone very engaged on national security stuff on the Republican side. He's a very serious guy. Uh, I think he's thoughtful. He's he's really, you know, he is a Republican politician. He, he you know, is a supporter of former President Trump uh, or was during the last election. I don't know where he is on that now. But at the same time, he also is somebody who's very serious on policy issues, has worked across partisan boundaries on a variety of issues, I, I think is seen as a serious guy by pretty much all corners. And I think is trying to, seems to be at least so far trying to chair the committee this way. And it's worth noting, there is a lot of highfalutin rhetoric around this uh, so that you kind of alluded to, Alan. But that's not unique to this committee, right? Like that language you use really could have been taken directly out of the Biden administration national security strategy, which similarly describes a big ideological competition that's going to define the next century of American existence. I don't always love rhetoric like that, uh, even where it may be accurate. I'm just not always sure how useful it is, but it's not a uniquely partisan thing here. So I actually think there's some potential for this to do some meaningful work in an area where there is substantial bipartisan consensus even if there are still substantial differences. And you have serious people here who, maybe not in floor speeches, but at least at committee meetings and activities, maybe can find common ground a little bit more. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic of that, but I'm curious about your all's reactions. So I, I uh, and this is, again, in my personal capacity, uh, I've worked with Congressman Gallagher and his office over the years, and I would echo that he is a very serious politician. He was a Marine Intel officer, he has a PhD, I think a few masters. He was actually the chair of the co-chair of the Cyber Solarium Commission that I was just talking about. So he really, when you think about people who get into the weeds of the issues and aren't looking for camera time, that that would be him. So I, I think the fact that he's chairing, I, I was actually kind of surprised that that they would pick such a serious person for a committee like this, which very easily could be a position that goes to the people who just look for camera time. And so I think that's a really positive development. And I, I think that really is across the board with all the members. I agree both on the Republican and Democratic sides. And I, I think this really 
demonstrates a bit of a shift in the public sentiment about China. I mean, in in the early 2010s, I mean, until 2015, the real concern about China was uh, economic espionage, intellectual property theft from companies. And that changed a bit after the 2015, I guess, understanding between Xi and Obama. And now it's really been repositioned over the past eight years as really this existential national security threat. And I think the fact that we have this committee is really a demonstration of that concern. Yeah, I will say I am I was struck by the sort of press tour that this committee is clearly doing where they uh, they have uh, sort of cuddly write ups in both Axios and the Wall Street Journal about how well, uh, you know, all the Democrats and all the Republicans get along and how serious they're being. In, in a way that actually, I and mean, I'm maybe a bit January 6th pilled, but reminded me of the January 6th committee and maybe wonder if they're sort of trying to piggyback off the success of that a little bit. Um, there was a note, I think, in the journal piece that uh, the committee's first hearing had been in the evening with lots of graphics and charts uh, in order to sort of gain public attention. That's that's a straight out of the January 6th committee playbook. And and of course, I should say, to, just to make it clear, part of what made the January 6th committee successful was that all the members were very much on the same page um, and were able to kind of make those public presentations coherently without constantly sniping at one another. So I will be interested in whether this committee can succeed in what it's doing, because I think it, it may be a sort of test case for whether the January 6th committee's very unusual model of carrying out its work and communicating to the public is replicable in another context. I I will say, you know, I think that you can see other committees in this Congress attempting that as well, just in terms of trying to like grab public attention and shape the narrative uh, in the the weaponization of law enforcement committee, for example, which is kind of belly flopped so far. It seems like uh, this may be more successful. And if that's so, I think it will be really interesting to take a, a look back after its work is over and consider where it was and wasn't able to follow in the January 6th committee's footsteps. I think the comparison to the Jan 6 committee is a really good one, but it also raises a question to me or underscores that I'm just not sure what this committee is supposed to do. So the January 6th committee's mandate was very clear. Like it was an investigatory body that was going to write a report, right? And it did that super well, but it was very clear what the success criteria were going to be. And it's not clear what the success criteria are going to be here because the way I see it, one possibility is it's trying to raise awareness about the you know rivalry and the competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. And for what it's worth, I think it's interesting that it's framed not as U.S. China but U.S. CCP, which I actually appreciate. I think that is a not just semantic difference. I think it is one that does underscore that like the quarrel is not with like China the people like the Chinese people or China the world historic five thousand year old civilization. It's with this like very specific group of people and person in particular who was running China. So I, I do appreciate that. But, you know, if it's just about consciousness raising, it seems unnecessary because I think like there isn't a big constituency that is trying to sing Kumbaya with the, the Chinese Communist Party right now in American politics or society. Well, except for the code pink people. Except for the code pink people. Yeah, those those incredibly, uh, incredibly She says powerful. in jest, code pink people, don't tweet at us. <laughs> she said that in jest. <laughs> or, or tweet at us, you know, you know, that's, do, do what you do. I mean, the other, so if that's the case, it seems unnecessary. The other possibility, and I'm curious what you all think about this, is, you know, right now, and I think this is a point that I, Ezra Klein has actually made, you know, over the last few years, I think quite well, you know, the only bipartisan thing that anyone can agree on in the United States is that China is a big threat. And so if you want to get something done in Congress, a really useful way of doing it is by framing it as a China policy, right? So like, if you want to support industrial policy in America, you 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 do it as a kind of anti-China bill, sort of in the same way that you uh, did a lot of domestic law, domestic policy in the 1950s as a kind of anti-Soviet stuff. So one possibility might be that this is a way to launder, and I don't mean that in necessarily a bad way, but to kind of launder domestic policies through a framing that both parties can get behind, which like could be clever, but I don't know. I, I I just I'm still kind of brought back to my first point, which is like I can't figure out what this is about. Like e even the stupid committee about weaponization of law enforcement. Like it's clear what the goal is. Like it's a fake goal, but it's clear what the goal is, and it's just not clear what the goal is here. But Scott, I think you're about to you're about to to, to school me. 
Well, I mean, Alan, I think you actually just kind of answered your own question, right? Like the problem with the China I'm that issue, good, ladies and gentlemen. I'm that you're good. You're just that good. You're so good you don't even know it. I mean, the problem with the China issue is that it has got this political grab that makes it a veil that people want to throw over whatever they're doing. And that makes it really, A, really easy to get bogged down in partisan politics, and B, a really easy to get distracted about what actually is meaningful to be done in this space that actually addresses a China threat versus a bunch of other agenda items people are trying to get through. So I kind of suspect the logic behind this committee, it doesn't say this, it's, it's, it's establishing language is super, super general, but it has no legislative authority. Its mandate really is to issue reports and recommendations in this policy space, right? But what I think it is an effort to do, and again, I think this is actually a good idea if it can work this way, and we'll see if it works, is to say, we are going to be the people who are going to identify, these are the things that really matter on China. And therefore, when other people try and use China as you know a hook to attach other things and pull other things in, and it's stuff that we've said is not really important and necessary, those are the things that we shouldn't focus on. Though they have less credibility on the China front. But we, a committee of up and comers, influential figures, and particularly some of the more serious, particularly national security oriented people in both sides of the aisle in the House. If we sign off on this, you can be confident this is actually a serious measure and warrants to be treated and considered seriously as an anti-China strategy point. And in that way, can clear the House or at least provide a mechanism for hopefully building bipartisan support around those proposals without getting caught up in all of the sturm und drang around China policy generally, right? Now, that's a very optimistic take about what this can accomplish. It's very ambitious. But I think that's probably why Mike Gallagher wanted this chair. It's something he's kind of been pushing for for a while because he's a pretty up and coming guy. I suspect he could have done more on the partisan side if he wanted to. Um, but he is a very serious, substantive guy. I suspect like most policy nerds, he probably likes working on nerdy things uh, as we do and wants to spend time in the weeds, which is easy to avoid in the house if you don't want to do it, get in the weeds, but he does seem to want to get in the weeds. And so this is one way to maybe do that a little more effectively. The, the challenge for them is going to be fighting back on those instincts as we get closer to 2024 to politicize this. Um, and that is going to be a real challenge. Um, and it's something that a lot of people, and frankly, probably particularly Republicans, are, are going to be under pressure from. And so that's going to be a real test for Gallagher's to the extent that he can keep those instincts cabined or from interfering with the work of the committee that is supposed to be obviously a much more bipartisan enterprise as far as I can tell. What's your over-under on that? It will just devolve into lab leak speculation. All the time. <laughs> All the time. 60, 40. Well, there was a, so, so as, as we're recording this, I think the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee just finished its uh, yearly worldwide threats hearing where uh, the Republican senators, I believe, were quite irate uh, with Director of National Intelligence of Real Haynes for refusing to say that she thought that it was definitely 100% a lab leak. So I can assure you that this discourse is not going away. <laughs> And the good news is it might be the only committee that does not have a Section 230 hearing. So I'm kind of counting on that. Wait, stop (laughs) saying stuff like, what is wrong? (laughs) Jeff's like, thank God I'm going on vacation because the China committee definitely have a Section 230 hearing next week. You just ruined it. I was actually about to make a TikTok joke. So I'm sure there's some way they can figure out how to get that in there. (laughs) I'm sure they will. I have no doubt. The real irony is if they if they started spinning off if they started spinning off sound bites of the committee on TikTok. I think they should just do that to get like really meta. Work on their <laughs> TikTok game. <laughs> well, folks, that brings us to the end of our time for this week. But this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over in the week to come until we were back in your podcast machine of choice. Alan, what do you have for us this week? So I have a book recommendation, which I'm delighted because I got to say, reading is like my great love in life and having a toddler definitely cuts into my reading time. And so it is such a joy when I find a book that just grabs me and just forces me to read it and where I stay up way past my bedtime, knowing that I'll regret it the next day because it is just so gripping. And so the book that I have consumed in the last 48 hours is uh, Fleischman is in Trouble. It's a book from 2019 by uh, Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Um, and I actually learned about it because it's just been turned in or it was turned in a few months ago into a miniseries with Jesse Eisenberg and Claire Danes and Lizzie Kaplan. I have not seen the miniseries, though I very much want to now. The book is, I, it's like a little bit of a cross between like Portnoy's Complaint and Bonfire of the Vanities 
And it's unbelievably funny. It just grabs you. Like by the time it's hooked you in with its humor, you, you don't realize what just like a devastating read it is. It's so good. Um, you know, I don't often read 400 page novels in 36 hours, but there, there, there we are. Um, I, I will say it is, it is not the most optimistic book about marriage and relationships, but it is real good. <laughs> so uh, highly recommended nevertheless. Quinta, how about you? What do you got for us this week? I think I have stand for the great New Yorker writer Rachel Aviv before on this podcast. Um, and so I would like to continue that by recommending an article that she has in the current issue of The New Yorker that is called Agnes Collard's Marriage of the Minds. And it is truly one of the most insane things I have read uh, in the last year, possibly ever. Um, so Agnes Collard is a philosopher, um, I believe in classical philosophy at the University of Chicago. And the article is about her quest to both live a philosophical life and analyze her her re- relationships through philosophy, seemingly to the extent of possibly destroying those relationships. What I'm trying to very delicately say here is that it's an article about how she uh, decided she was in love with her, her male grad student, divorced her husband, married the former grad student. The three of them are now living together and raising their three children. And none of them seem like hugely happy. Uh, and the whole the whole thing is just totally fascinating. There are elements of it that make it kind of a sort of, you know, train wreck you can't look away. But I think part of what makes Aviv such an incredibly talented writer is that she's so good at balancing the sort of train wreck reality television aspect of this with the parts of it that actually are quite moving and human and very thought provoking, even as I finished it and thought, oh my God, this was insane. I need to send it to every single person I know. So highly recommended. So I, I've also read it. it. I mean, it's clearly worth reading. It's an exceptional piece of journalism. I, I do have some, I got to say, some ethical qualms about like, why marrying you your take... grad student? No, no, fine. Marry your grad student. Oh no! But, oh, I object to that. No, very I don't. Much. I think the marrying the grad student thing is no, no, no. Like, why are you writing about like fundamentally pri- like the private lives? Yes, of yes. Private people. Like, I just, I don't. This is a criticism not of Rachel Aviv, but of Agnes Collard, right? <laughs> just be clear. Well, it's kind of. I mean, it's maybe a bit of a criticism of Rachel Aviv. Like, oh. I'm just, and, and like, and like to be clear, like, like. Like Agnes Collard agreed to do this, right? So there's like plenty. I just, I, wait, why, why do you need to write this piece? Like, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Be, just because of the train wreck element of it. I'll say I read this article as well. I actually was planning to use it as my object lesson. Then Quinta beat me. I stole it, it into the into the Google Doc. I will say I read it. I, I will double down that it is a phenomenal read because the author uh, Rachel Aviv is just phenomenal. Um, and now it makes me want to go read many more of her, much more of her work. I don't know if they struck me as fundamentally unhappy because of this situation any more so than any three philosophy professors have ever been unhappy it's a very low bar uh, i feel like probably in the world but uh but you know i thought there were a lot of human touching parts of it even if fundamentally i came away from it saying god bless my wife who's wonderful and thank god i have such a wonderful relationship that doesn't have these bigger questions uh poking their heads up every once in a while um so but it's still a phenomenal read i did think parts of it really resonated so i i thought it was interesting i actually kind of want to go read for my sins, uh, Professor Collard, some of her books she's written on this exact topic. So we'll see if I have time. But, but I have a toddler, so it probably will never happen. But I'm intrigued enough to try. For my object lesson this week, I saw a lovely story that warmed my heart, uh, which is that Eddie Izzard, a phenomenal comedian for the last several decades, been around for a very long time, has uh, adopted the name Susie Eddie Izzard. Eddie Izzard, for folks who don't know, uh, has came out as trans, I think, in the 80s, a very, very long time ago, has had a kind of gender fluid identity for much of her career, uh, where she would play certain male presenting roles, um, but generally on stage would be female presenting or kind of gender fluid, started using female pronouns just in the last few years, if I recall correctly, and now has decided to change uh, or to adopt an additional name as Susie, because she says, I've always wanted to be called Susie, but I got famous as Eddie Izzard, so I couldn't really lose it. But now I'm at a stage of my career slash life where 
that's more important. And I think it's actually kind of a heartwarming story to see somebody um, who uh, is in the public eye say, I'm going to do something to live my life the way I want. And I thought it was a lovely story. But more perhaps more relevantly for folks here, it made me go back and watch her amazing comedy special, Dress to Kill, from back in 2000, I think. I think it was recorded in like the late 90s in San Francisco. It is just absolutely phenomenal. It's such a good two hour long stand up set that I think is actually all available on YouTube now. Um, if you have not watched it, it is a lot of it's about world history. She pulls in all these amazing cultural and historical threads and touchstones. It, I think it's really phenomenal. So I would strongly recommend folks check that out. Jeff, what do you have for us this week? Well, so I was planning to use the new Nicki Minaj single, but I realized this was a classy audience, so it really I had is to not. pick something different. It really is not. Uh, <laughs> so, which I do recommend, but what what I'm choosing is this amazing new novel called "My Last Innocent Year" by Daisy Albert Florin. It it resonates a bit because it's set in at a college in the late '90s when I went to college, and it. It's about a tale that's been told before about a college student who has an affair with a married professor. But what I think is so impactful about this is it really, without beating you over the head with it, causes the audience to reassess the Clinton impeachment and all of the events surrounding it and how the media and politicians treated Monica Lewinsky. And there are references to what's going on in the news at the time while they're, the author is telling this very deeply personal uh, and complex story. And I, I think just like a lot of the things that Monica Lewinsky has done in the past few years with her TED Talk and her other writings, I, I think this this is really the novel form of getting all of us in our country to really reassess how we reacted to that entire story and to perhaps learn some lessons about how we approach them in the future. That sounds phenomenal, Jeff. That's a great recommendation. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit lawfareblog.com for our show page, for links to past episodes, for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and to leave a rating and review wherever you might be listening. Also, sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawfare for an ad-free version of this podcast amidst other very special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Patcha Howell. On behalf of my co-hosts, Alan and Quinta, and our special guest, Jeff Kosseff, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>